This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze, our journey through life. Now, you're not going to get through life without getting in the maze. You're going to get stuck somewhere along the line. You're going to have to make a decision. Do I go forward? Do I just sit here on the ground and feel sorry for myself? I've been there, and there were many times I sat on the ground and just cried my eyes out. But you know what? That's not the way to get through life. And our guest today, Brad Minus, is going to tell us about his story. And Brad, when I read your bio, it was the first line in it that says, after years of being a workaholic, and it was like, ah, I know what that's like. Um, not only did I constantly want to prove myself at my jobs, constantly trying to prove myself with family and friends and taking on one more thing so that I would look like I was accomplished. And uh, it took me a long time to realize that just because you're spinning your wheels doesn't mean you're accomplishing anything at the end of the day. So give us a little bit of background and tell us what got you to where you are today and the things that you're doing. Well, thank you for having me on the podcast. That's first of all, um, I appreciate it. And I started uh, in the military and where we were kind of meant to keep in shape. Well, when I left the military, I ended up in the corporate world. And of course, like you said, you know, you wanted to prove yourself. You wanted to say that, hey, I'm not a one trick pony. I didn't spend nine and a half years in the military and do good things there and not be able to do it in the corporate world. So, of course, I ended up moving to, you know, 15, 16, 17 hour days when you were supposed to work nine to five. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, we have to do something in the evening or you want to do your extra reports, make sure that you're good for the next day or, you know, taking on more from work where you might be working out of hours. And that kind of happened to me. So it was a few years that I was working this 15, 12 to 15 hours a day, sometimes on the weekends. Well, I went to the doctor and of course, this was just a routine physical. And she said, you need to take some blood work and came back after the blood work. And she's like, what's going on with you? And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, your triglycerides are off the charts. Your cholesterol is high. Your blood pressure is high. You're about 15 pounds overweight. And I'm used to seeing you when you were in the military and you were you were doing really, really well. And uh, that kind of threw me for a little bit because, you know, my family has had some issues, health issues. So I happened to be walking around a strip center a few days later and I noticed a sign and it said boot camp. And so this is when these boot camp classes just started right. to pop up. And I got to this boot camp and I said, well, because of my military background, of course, that kind of spoke to me. So I attended the three classes, which were a half hour long. And I think the first one I had to like at 20 minutes, I had to sit down. I was dizzy the whole bit. And that really got to me because while I was in the military, I ran, uh, I ran 10 milers. I, you know, we were running two and a half, three miles a day without a problem. I was running in, in cadence. I mean, it was, it was, I was in a lot better shape. So I decided to go on and take that class and it was six weeks long and you would just like repeat it. So you do six weeks and then you do another six weeks. They do new content. So you would always get new exercises and stuff. And then the second one, I met a new person, uh, a friend, his name is Scott. And he said to me, Hey, you know what? We're doing this marathon for PKD, polycystic kidney disease. And we're doing it for PKD because my wife has it. Now, I had sworn off running exactly 10 years earlier. And, and I was like, oh, hang on a second. What are we doing here? But it, I was so compelled by his story that I decided, okay, let me give this a shot. So we started training. And I started getting in better shape. And my initial twice a week boot camp all of a sudden turned into five days a week and then six days a week. And it was slow and the results started to come. We lost weight. My next set of labs were good. Everything was going wonderful. 
we're we're training for the marathon and we're about two weeks from it and I'm in the boot camp class and we're doing these things called suicides where you're like uh you're on the basketball court so it's to the to the key to the second key to the free throw line then all the way through and then you turn around and come back and I'm just about to turn around and my and I turn and my foot gets stuck right in place so and all of a sudden my back goes and like it was so loud the whole place heard it my all of my friends in class heard this big snap and they looked at me and I was like I'm okay so I kept going and they're like wait 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 and my the instructor's like Brad maybe you should go back you take a shower you know make sure you're you're okay and I'm like no 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 no. it was just a pop I'm fine well the endorphins were running so well that I didn't feel it until I started to cool down. I just happened to have a chiropractor appointment that day. So I'm like, oh, you know what? If it starts to hurt, no big deal. She'll pop it into place. I'll be fine. On my way, everything started to fall apart. My legs started to hurt. They started to go numb. My back was hurting. And I get in to the chiropractor's office and she did something that she's not supposed to do. You are never supposed to uh, uh, adjust a patient that's in trauma and my back was in trauma but she adjusted me anyway and I passed out from the pain Wow! they put me on the table they tried all these different things and finally we ended up having to have the ambulance come and take me to the hospital so I got uh, I ended up getting a an MRI and a CT scan they gave me some muscle relaxers and I ended up on my back for I don't know the two weeks Now, I did go to Chicago and cheer my friends on, but I didn't run it. Came home and I had appointments with both an orthopedic surgeon and a a neurosurgeon. And they both told me the same thing. They said, Brad, you are not going to be able to run more than two miles for the rest of your life. And they said, you're going to be able to run two miles, maybe this is without pain is what they're saying is that you're not gonna run without pain. I couldn't accept that. You know, I had just, I was trained up for the 26.2 mile marathon. Um, so I couldn't accept it. I kept trying to go back. I kept trying to run in it and it, it was painful. They were right about that. And, but I just, in my soul, I couldn't accept it. So I decided, I, I said, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to get to the Chicago Marathon the following year. So I started researching. I like, I read Gray's Anatomy from cover to cover. I started learning how to trace where everything would happen on my spine while I ran. I talked to numerous experts, talked to licensed mar- uh, massage therapists. I talked to running coaches. I talked to as many people as possible and started realizing that maybe I could change my running form to protect my back. Meanwhile, strengthening my core to keep everything together. So when a chiropractor adjusts you and puts everything in line and um, he like, if you're kind of out of whack, he puts you back. Right. It doesn't mean it's going to stay there. He just puts you back. You've got to develop things around. You got to do exercises to keep this together. So when my chiropractor showed me my x-rays and said, okay, this is where you are. This is where you need to be. And once we get you there, you need to protect it. So I started talking to other running coaches, people that developed like the pose method um, and Newton running. And they basically, you know, talked to me about impact. I'm like, all right, well, I just have to figure out a way to keep the impact, the impact off my back. So I changed my running form like three times to where I am now which actually turned out to be the most natural running form for the human body. So I actually learned how to barefoot, you know, it was basically barefoot running, Um, but not in barefoot shoes, but it took all the, it took a lot of the impact, like 90% of the impact off my back. So after spending three months developing this form, I was going to run the, the Chicago marathon in order to keep myself fit. I started cross training. 
uh, my friend said, Hey, do you want to do a, do you want to do a triathlon with me? And I did one with him and it was a sprint. It was, so it's a little bit slow. It's slow. It's small. It's only 400, uh, 400 meter swim, 10 mile bike, 3.1 mile run, which was for me was slow at the time. I was just starting getting into it. And, but I fell in love with triathlon at the time because I was on the bike a lot. So I would be able to keep the pressure off my back. Right. Um, well, I'd gotten so good that I decided that, all right, I'm going to do an Ironman while I'm at it. So two years after my injury, I ended up doing uh, the Chicago Marathon. And then I did Florida Ironman like the very next month. Well, because of the marathon being before the Ironman, I wasn't going to do, I wasn't racing the marathon. I had decided I'm just going to let my legs do what they're going to do, take it nice and easy. Well, we were fundraising for PKD again, and we had a lady, her name was Karen Grimaldi. And I kind of thought that I think she had more in her than what she thought. And six months prior to that, she had done the Nice Marathon in France. And she did it in a time of five, five twenty. Um, so I said, all right, listen, I'm doing this easy. You don't run that. You don't run that fast. And I think you have more than five twenty. So I put a strategy together and I said, okay, we're doing this together. And we crossed hand in hand at four thirty two, wow. which was almost 50 minutes faster than what she did before. Her friend comes up to me after we're done and we've got like 20 people that we have on this team. And her friend comes up to me, Bibka, um, and says, you know, Karen is like on cloud nine right now. She's like, she never thought in a million years that she could do that. She goes, you should coach. And I said, I, I would love to, except that I don't have any credits. You know, I don't, I don't haven't podiumed anything. She goes, well, not right now, but next month you will, you know? And I'm like, and then I remember dawned on me, oh, I'll have an Ironman underneath my belt. That'll give me some credit. So and that's how it started. So now I coach endurance athletes. Um, I have 15 people on my roster right now. Um, I've had as many as 22. And they're a combination of marathon runners, ultra marathon runners, um, triathletes, long distance and short distance triathletes, and some sprinters. That's where I am today. So... Let's take a step back because before the military, were you an athletic type guy? Were you this type of guy that said, um, I don't even know if I can make it in the military if I have to uh, climb ropes and go over a wall? <laughs> That's funny you say that because, no, I was the kid that would always get picked last if we were playing intramural sports. Um, I thought... I'd actually have been become a pretty good soccer player, but not realizing that my because my dad was the coach, he kind of was putting me in a little bit more than everybody else. Um, and I didn't know that because he'd always told me, no, I'm not playing favorites. You get to play because you're good and blah, blah, blah. And don't get me wrong. I worked at it, but I wasn't as good as these other kids. Not even close. Um, baseball didn't work out. I had tried hockey. I had tried pretty much anything. Um, I did do cross country in school. I was decent at that, but I never really thought about anything beyond. So no, I was not athletic whatsoever. I like to try, but I really wasn't. So here you were told you could, you probably would never run more than two miles if two miles. And yet you proved it wrong. You, but it took a lot of research on your part and trial and error. It's not like you just said, okay, I'm going to go run a half mile today and a mile tomorrow and a mile and a half, you know, and just keep building. You had to research it. So what did your doctors finally say when you know, you said, hey, I just ran a marathon in four and a half minutes. Well, it wasn't four and a half minutes. It was four and a half, four oh, and a half hours. I meant <laughs> four and a half hours. So. I was like, I was like, I just broke the world record. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's why um, I told my my um, 
my primary care physician, because at this time, you know, basically it was a one and done thing. They, they, they saw my x-rays, we talked, they moved me around, they, they examined me. And that's when they both came up with this conclusion. Um, so I never really saw them again, but my primary care physician was off uh, in another world, especially because not only was I moving around and my back was better, but my blood counts were better. <laughs> And that's more what she was worried about. But it was she was pretty surprised to see that all of a sudden, you know, here I was uh, two years, less than two years prior to that. And I was on my back icing every night. Um, literally, I would uh, I was able to work from home and I would sit in my bed with my knees up, balancing my balancing my laptop on my thing with the camera coming down and me having a microphone, you know what I mean? So it was, uh, and that was 2008. So, you know, the, the technology really right. wasn't that great at that either anyway, but it was at least better than I was at least able to keep my, keep my job. Um, and that was a week and a half like that without me able to get up, you know, um, get up to go to the bathroom to eat. And that's about it. That's all I was able to do. And of course, under heavy muscle relaxers. So yeah, she was, she was pretty shocked. So was a lot of my friends. Well, I'm still sitting here in shock, too, because it just seems, you know, how can you do that? But a lot of it is, is mental. I mean, there is physical there, okay? Um, I just went through something not quite as drastic as you, but a year ago, I had a accident. I fell. Um, I fell on my right side, but my left side all of a sudden wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And as I laid on the ground um, and they ended up calling EMS, EMS is trying to get me to scoot over onto the, the gurney. And it's like, my left side is as heavy as it's going to be. Took them four days in the hospital of having me lay flat on my back, not knowing what was wrong, saying, we're going to send you to physical therapy and um, you're going to have to go to rehab. And we don't know what's going to happen. And it was like, oh, my God. Like, I was at the car wash, and I was vacuuming up my car, and I fell, and now I can't walk. I mean, come on. And there's nothing broken, okay? MRI, CT scan, whatever. I was grateful they sent me to rehab because as soon as I got to rehab, they said to me, we're going to show you how to move that left side. And did it hurt? Absolutely. Did it get better? Absolutely. A year later, all of a sudden, the injury that I really had to my right side blossomed. And when I woke up with the pain, I called my doctor and I said, this is ridiculous. I haven't had a fall since last year, went through the whole thing. He said, your body was traumatized. It thought it was the left side. It wasn't. You put all that mental energy into getting the left side better. The right side really has been more weak. These are the things you need to do. And that day he told me, I'm going to tell you, Brad, was the day that I found your bio. And as I was reading it, I said, I just want to be able to get up and down and move around and sit here and do my show without being in pain. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to figure it out. A physical therapist had no idea. Basically it was, well, Karen, you should stand while you do your show. But standing was painful. Right. And so, but I figured out in between shows, I had to get up. I had to walk. Mm -hmm. I have a stationary bike. I have to ride my stationary bike, but I found the things and when I finally told my physical therapist and my doctor what I was doing, they said, that sounds crazy. But yet, I'm not in pain. There you go. So it was something that I read in your bio that said, you know what? If somebody says they don't know, then you got to try. You got to. I figured, how much worse could I get? You know, right. and I'm sure that's probably how you felt as well. Oh, that's exactly right. I, I, you know, I refuse 
to give up on the fact that I, I just wanted to be able to run this one marathon. I wasn't expecting to do 37 is where I am at right now. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, and that's exactly right. It's like you try something and you move on. Does it, is it painful? Yes. Is it a pain? Is it an injury pain or is it a non-use pain or is it an overuse pain? And that's kind of like where you, you go from that. But if it's an injury pain, you stop. If you feel like, okay, it's like, it feels like a cramp or it feels like a soreness. Okay. We might need to pull, we need to go through that. And if that pain intensifies, then, okay, we need to pull back for a, temporarily and then move forward. But it's funny you say that it was, uh, you fall on your right side and your left side hurt. I talk about that with my clients all the time. I um I have some of them that are like, hey, my, my left hip is really bugging me. But then when I look at them and I do, you know, a, a functional analysis and I look at them, it's their right side that's kind of folded down or they're dropping their their right hip i'm like the imbalance is on the right but they're feeling it on their left because the body is just like what you did the body is overcompensating so yeah they might have injured the right they've got imbalance on the right so they're automatically going to hit their left more 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 therefore using overuse on the left causing a problem but what if we would have addressed the right side then they wouldn't have gone through that at all but um, nothing but like what, what like what happened to you it doesn't show up it's just an imbalance they just think it's an imbalance or they're not even consciously thinking about it till it's too late so and i tell this and I'm, my clients i mean like ma massage therapists good massage therapists good chiropractors as a regular training aid as a regular resource in your bucket no matter what sport you're doing, whether you're weightlifting, whether you're swimming, whether you're horseback riding or even motorcycle riding is a good uh, part of your training regimen because those people will be able to look at you because you can't do it yourself. It's just impossible. You can look at the mirror and if you look at the mirror and something's off, you automatically correct it. Oh, no, right. I'm fine. Yeah. But a, but a good LMT, a good Cairo will be able to look at you and go, okay, there's an imbalance here. But if you don't go regularly, if it's not something that's every couple of weeks, every three weeks or whatever, you're not, they're, they're not gonna have the time to find that imbalance and make the correction for you. So when I did my first Ironman, I had a village. My, my, phys, my, my primary care physician, my chiropractor, my LMT um, and my physical therapist, they would meet on Zoom every month and they would talk and they, oh, and my coach, um, my coach at the time, um, they would meet and they would talk. They're like, oh, hey, I'm moving Brad into this direction. And I've done this now too. I've actually, right. with some people that have been, that have had a little bit more, are a little more injury prone, um, meet, talk, and they're like, all right, he's going into a week or he's going into a couple of weeks where he's going to be pushing harder. What does everybody see? And the LMT goes, okay, well, he's still favoring the right side because his left side's hurting. So um, I would say that, you know, watch him while he runs and make sure he makes the corrections. Um, PCP would say his levels look great or, you know what, his levels are a little off in this side. Maybe you need to uh, hold off on those hard weeks, move him up one more week and let's see how he's doing. So they would all meet together and they would decide um what was going on and it was a village that got me through the first one after that i can pretty much take care of myself but that first one coming off of the injury making sure that i didn't re-injure myself that was um it was crucial well and one of the things that we're learning today in medicine um and i don't know if it's like this in your area but when i go to see my general practitioner usually it's a conversation very little exam mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, it used to be when you went in, they they would actually examine you, they would touch your body. And now it's like, well, you know, I don't have to do that. Oh, you say you have a pain, I'll send you for an x-ray, I'll send you for an MRI, whatever. Um, but I've asked my physician since this, since this accident happened last year, and now realizing that I was 
treating one side of my body when it was really the other side of my body that really needed treatment. When I go in and I have discomfort, I will ask him, I will show him, I will ask him to touch me there and tell me, you know, what do you see? I also stand up straight and say, you know, am I leaning to the right? Am I leaning to the left? Because I do notice that when I was in recovery, I was limping like crazy. And I didn't know how to stop limping when the pain started to go away. And I had to call my physical therapist and say, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And she said, you better come in. And I would go in for walking lessons. I mean, who would have thought you had to have walking yeah. lessons? But I was used to doing that. When I go up and down the steps, I could go up and down the steps every other step. Coming down, I think it was more out of fear. I was coming down one at a time. Mm -hmm. And she said, you're throwing your balance off. You know, use your handrails. I don't care. But don't go down one step at a time. You are capable of going down every other step. And that probably took me weeks to get, gain the confidence. I'd start doing it and be like, ah, can't do this. And then it was like, if I'm not going to, if I don't do this, I'm not going to get better. So as a coach, when your client is with you, they're going to do what you suggest they do. What mm -hmm. happens when they go home? Are they all really following through or are they coming back and saying to you, oh, I did that, you know, let's go on to the next thing when they haven't done anything in the past week? So, um, so I re it doesn't happen as much as, as as much as you think. It does happen, but I already know about it. So my clients all wear a wearable, um, a Garmin watch. Um, I've got one client that uses Apple, not as happy with that, but a Garmin watch. And that feeds into a website program that I use that we use for communication. So if they go to do their run, their bike, their swim, their strength train, they set their watch, they do their, they, they start it, they go and they do their thing and then they stop it. And that uploads automatically to this software that then I can see for instance, if they're running, I can see the pace. I can see where they ran. I can see what the temperature was. I can see what their heart rate was. I can see what their cadence was. I can see. And so if they don't use their watch, I know that they probably didn't do it because it's been, it's very, I'm very, very adamant about like you put it on, you start it. I've got, and then most of the time, they'll even go, people go even uh, up above the, above that. I've got a couple of guys that are a little, a little bit older. And they still have the practice of, you know what, they go work out and then they have breakfast, they go work and at lunch, they, they eat their lunch and then they go walk for a half hour at dinner. Then they go walk for a half hour, even though they've done this great big, like uh, hour and a half workout in the morning. It's just a normal thing for them. They, they eat, they walk, they eat, they walk and they start it. They start their watch for the walk. Um, and I see it. So I, it, it really tells me a lot. So it's very rare that that actually happens. What does happen, though, is if I make corrections in their run, if I make corrections in their swim, and then I see them again, they and I find that they had, nothing's really changed, that has happened. And that just is a fallback to habit. And that's something that we really, uh, everybody has this issue, um, whereas they learn something, and if they don't adapt, if they don't think, apply what they've learned and continue to apply what they learned thinking, they're not going to change that form, change right. that habit. Um, there's four stages to learning or to breaking a habit. One is unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. Second is conscious incompetence. Hey, my coach just told me that I'm not following through. So I know what I don't know, and I got to practice it. Then there's conscious competence where now I've practiced it. And if I think about it, I'll do it right. If I stop thinking about it, and that's the key. If I stop thinking about it, I go back into old habits. Then you get to the last stage, which is unconscious 
competence, meaning that it's muscle memory. And if I'm doing it, I'm doing it right every time without thinking about it. And it's that it's when they get to conscious competence that people tend to fall back into old habits because they're like, oh, I learned this new thing. Okay, I've got it. I've got it. And then all of a sudden you look back at them and you're like, no, you're not reaching out. You are still shallow. So here are your cues, follow the cues. And if they're not thinking about those cues, then they're not, they're going to fall back into old habits. Well, you know, it's interesting because I use an Apple watch, but I have learned there are certain things that um, I, well, whenever I ride my stationary bike, I always use it. Okay. And it's for my own use more than anything else. But I started using it when I'm walking in the pool because I have been overdoing it. And I didn't realize how much I was overdoing. So I'd go in the pool and I'd say, well, I'm going to give myself an hour to be outside before I go back to work. But I'd spend that whole hour walking and exercising in the water. Mm -hmm. And I'd get out, I'd feel good. But then I would be sore. And I was... I did that right from day one. So I was overdoing it. I didn't do it gradually. And I realized that some of the movements I was doing in the water, I was not doing properly. So sometimes I was slipping in the water. Sometimes I was um, just not, I was doing squats, but I wasn't doing my squats right. And so I started thinking about what am I supposed to do? And now when I go out there, I'm not going and doing it for an hour. I'm doing it for a good 20 to 30 minutes, but I'm concentrating on what I'm doing. I want those movements to become habit so that eventually when I'm in the water, I don't have to think as hard about it. It's just going to happen. So my question to you is, were those the metrics that you used that told you that you were overdoing it? Was the fact that you were sore and that you were slipping and that you didn't think you were doing good form? Were those the three things that came to you about that? So I I knew almost immediately that my form was bad. Okay. That um, I should have been wearing water shoes rather than being barefoot in the pool here because their walking lane is sort of on a slope. Mm. And so my feet would slip. But when I wore the water shoes, I had a nice grip. Okay. Um, And the fact that I was constant movement for one hour, I just didn't stop. And so I realized that, you know, you don't start exercising like that right from the beginning. But I did. It was the beginning of the summer and I was going out there four days a week, minimum, sometimes seven, and doing the same routine over and over again. Couldn't understand why I was starting to hurt so badly. And then I was finally told, you need to take a rest time, not Mm -hmm. just one day, take a couple days of rest. Okay. There are simple things you can do in the house, but minimal. And I was told to keep a diary of it, to be truthful to myself, which is very difficult when you want to get everything corrected because you say, I'll do 10 more. (laughs) <laughs> so recovery is very important so, and especially i believe we're, you might not think that i am but i think we're probably in the same peer group um and for us it's even more it's more important that you recover and you leave your time to recover now recovery doesn't mean completely becoming sedentary so in my case it's like all right if i'm running a lot then I won't run the next day. I'll cycle and I'll cycle easy. And then there's, and of course, then there's level of the vessel as well. You know, if, especially in running, if you're just a runner, not, I'm okay. I'm not gonna say just anything, but if you are a specifically a runner, um, you don't do two long runs back to back, unless you're an ultra runner, but you don't do two hard runs back to back. You might do a long run at an easy pace. You might do a medium run at a harder pace. That's fine. Or you might not do, you're you're not going to do a sprint, a sprint workout and a tempo workout right afterwards. 
you're going to do a tempo, you're going to do a speed workout, a long, easy run, and then you'll do your tempo workout. And that's considered recovery. Yes, it's active recovery, but it's still recovery. Um, and so it's, it's extremely important because remember that muscles don't get bigger, don't get stronger, don't get more flexible while doing the workout. Muscles gain strength, get bigger for if you're working on hy uh, hypertrophy or if, or um, or stronger when we rest. It's when you sleep and you rest. That's when they get stronger, bigger, and more flexible. The act is the stimulus to allow them. When you're working out with weights or when you were running, the reason why you were sore is because you you were literally breaking down the fibers of the muscle well when you rest those muscle those fibers repair themselves and they prepare them stronger the spring becomes stronger um so that's that's why it's so important that we we regulate our sleep and that adults are getting anywhere from six to six to eight hours a night um uh, 20 and under should be getting, uh, uh, um, eight to 11 hours, uh, eight to 10 hours a night. Um, and because not only now that we're talking about muscular, but also brain function, the brain is the same thing. It's, you know, that organ needs rest. Uh, so that's why it's, it's recovery is so important. And then of course, recovery is also, um, uh, massage, whether you're doing a licensed massage therapist or a therapy gun, or you have some sort of recovery routine that you go through. Right. So the biggest trend right now is your morning routine. Wake up, plunge into the cold, do your workout, write in your journal, you know? <laughs> um, but we also have a recovery routine. So if you're doing whatever you're doing, you're like, okay, my, my people foam roll, use a massage gun, stretch, go, uh, um, maybe they'll do a yoga session. They'll do a Pilates session. It's something to do something different with the muscles at a slower pace, um, at a lot, lot lower of an effort in order to run lactic acid through the muscle or give that muscle time to heal. Oh, very interesting. I didn't know anything about the resting period other than I thought it was supposed to slow down the pain. So, mm -hmm. but I will tell you, this is the first time I was told, you know, for resting, you know, she told me how to ride my bike differently, which was nice. Um, you know, she said, I don't know what tension you have it on now, but you, I don't want you riding it on tension, but I want you to keep that movement going. Um, we went through a couple of other exercises and she said, this is how I want you to do them. Because if you stop movement, it's going to be harder to start back up when you're ready. And so I've been sharing that with a lot of my clients that it's the same thing in anything we do in life. You know, if you want something to happen, sometimes you got to slow down your thinking. Okay. You got to re-prepare. You got to take a pivot. It's okay, but don't stop. So you are now in the midst of being a coach and you've got your, your health back together. Um, any extra words that you could tell our listeners because so many people go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, your cholesterol is high, your blood pressure is up, and um, here I'm going to write this prescription for you because, hey, I don't trust you're going to do anything else. In fact, that's how they talk to my husband in their right because he won't do anything else. <laughs> when they talk to me, it's always like, do I have an alternative? And if I do... Um, I go with it, but what's it like for you and your clients? Well, first of all, we're all active participants. Uh, my biggest thing, I'll give you for instance, right? So a lot of my clients, they find that, so they'll, something will happen in their fetal herd or new clients, especially they'll come in and they'll tell me, oh, I've got orthotics, you know? And I said, okay, well, you got them from the podiatrist. Sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no. But for the ones that went to the podiatrist, I said, okay, so how long have you been wearing them? And they're like, oh, three, four years. I'm like, okay, this is what I would do about it. I like, first of all, take an active role in your own healthcare. Ask the questions, make sure that you know. 
And anything that you go on, whether it be medication or orthotics, is you need to find out, is this something for the rest of my life or is this something that's temporary? And then find out why is it permanent? You know, why am I going to be taking this for the rest of my life? Is there an alternative just like what you mentioned? Now, as far as my example with orthotics, I say, okay, if a podiatrist gives you a recommendation for orthotics and they provide them for you, they do the ordering, they do the measuring and everything else. My first question to them is great. I'll wear them. I'll do what you say, doc, but you need to give me a care plan to get out of them. Orthotics are very expensive. They're $400 a piece, right? right? So whether you think about it or not, I'm not saying that any, any, any podiatrist is bad or they're good, but either way, they're getting a piece of it. And those orthotics last about two months, three months, maybe if you're using them regularly, if they're putting it, if you're in, if it's in your everyday shoe, you need to talk to that doctor and say, okay, I need a way to get out of this. What's our care plan? If they put you on a medication, they say, oh, it's permanent. Why is it permanent? Is there a way for me to get away from this? Is there something I need to do? Because just like you said with your husband, your husband is going to take what the doctor says and he's just going to take it as face value and do it. But some of us don't want to be on medication. I don't want to have these foreign bodies in my, in uh, these foreign things in my body if I don't want them. Um, food is medicine, by the way. There's a ways to get around things just by using right. food and diet. So I would ask, I'm like, okay, I got high cholesterol. What do I need to do to get off of the statin? What do I need to get off of it? Well, you need to eat more multigrains. You need to stay away from sugar, stay away from caffeine, da 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 da, da. And I'm like, okay, if I do that, do you think that I'll be able to get off the statin? If you do that religiously and you 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 have limited consumption, then yes, you should be able to get off that statin. What else? I need to work out. Okay, what? how much do I need to work out? What should I do? Um, and then I would find something. Now, here's where my personal motivation comes through and I think is a motivation that I think everybody can speak to. And that is to challenge yourself to something you never thought possible. So originally that Ironman that I did was, I did that specifically because I never thought I'd be able to do something like that. Um, and I have another client who weighed 250 pounds. She was 5'1", um, and she, she was way overweight. And instead of going, okay, well, I'm going to, go to the gym, I'm going to diet, I'm going to do all this stuff. She said she saw the Kona Ironman on television. She got, in, she kind of, kind of trance to it. And she goes, I'm going to do one of those. So she happened to find the same one that I did um, a couple of years later um, in Florida. And she goes, I'm going to train for that. So instead of, okay, diet, exercise, go to the gym, the normal way everybody thinks about how am I going to lose weight? How am I going to get fit? She goes, no, I'm going for this higher goal, something bigger than myself. And it's, let me tell you something, and I don't care what anybody says. It's a lot more fun thinking about, all right, how am I going to get to that start line? How am I going to be able to get through 2.4 miles of a swim followed by 112 miles on a bike followed by a marathon? How am I going to get through all that? What do I need to train to get there? And how am I going to fuel my body? Well, I got to tell you, you go out and you start going out for an hour bike ride, an hour hard bike ride the last thing you want to do is screw it all up with some sugar yeah you're not going for the chocolate bar you're thinking okay well i just broke down my muscles you get to you you research your own stuff because you really want it you're you're doing all this wonderful things for your body how do i fuel it to make sure that i can uh, perform and that's not with you know reese's pieces and and milk duds um that's got to be done with lean meat so she learned how to eat to fuel, which then ended up as a fringe benefit of her going after this big goal, which is a lot more fun. She ended up losing uh, 135 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, and she got obviously super fit and she was amazing. And she got, she stood on the start line on the beach in a size small wetsuit at 120 pounds. And she looked beautiful and she killed it. She ended up doing it like in 11, 11 hours and 30 minutes, um, which is superb for a first time Ironman. Um, so, yeah, I think if you find 
yourself in a situation um, where you, your health is declining or you have a part of your body that's not working like it should. Maybe there's a goal that you can think of that curing or making that part stronger, better, faster will get you there on the way. You know, like I keep telling people, and I like the biggest one is like, all right, hey, why can't you climb Mount Everest? What do you need to do? You need to train. You need to have, um, and you need to know that you know, know the territory. Find someone that's done it. You got to do, you got to do all that stuff. So, how much fun is it to research that, right? And you go, okay, well, now I got to, I got to train for it. I got to be able to walk upstairs. I got to walk up that. Much easier for me to think about. Okay, I'm going to go do this workout so I can learn how to walk up. I learn how to hold, how to get a backpack on with my with with good with good form with good posture. Um, I'm going to walk. I'm going to do what we call the gauntlet, which is the old stairmaster, which it looks like a treadmill of stairs. Yep. I'm going to I'm going to start with, you know, 15 minutes of this gauntlet. I'm going to work my way up to an hour and then I'm going to go back. I'm going to do for 15 minutes, but I'm going to do it with a pack with 10 pounds in it. And then I'm going to do that for an hour. Then I'm going to move, move it to 30 pounds and then 40 pounds. Um, and that's going to make me stronger. Right. And then longer and longer and then stronger and stronger. But that's knowing that there's a this big giant goal, something that no one else has done or very few people have done. And there's that goal. That makes it a lot easier now because of what you're doing, you're going to research it because it's not about you just getting better. It's about you getting to that start line and completing that, that big giant goal you've got for yourself. That's a lot more fun than going, oh, yeah, let me go check the scale again. No, yeah. not not where I want it to be. Let me look in the mirror. Oh, still got this belly. Oh, I got I got to keep working. Got to keep working. Whereas you're like, no, hey, I did 15 minutes on the stairmaster with a 30 pound weights on. Yeah, those are those little tiny goals that get you up there. Those are by far a lot more fun and a lot more exciting and a lot more positive than looking at the scale, counting calories doing all this stuff, you get there a much better fuel and exercise, um, food and exercise is medicine. It's medicine. And uh, there's so many good case studies out there for that. Well, we certainly learned a lot today and I certainly appreciate it. Um, how can our listeners find you if they want to learn more from you? So um, I have a website, a uh, couple websites. So my main website for my business, my business is called Inner fire endurance sports and the uh, the website is innerfireendurance.com all one word um and you can i my it goes directly to my email if you go into the contact us page but i also have a podcast called life changing challengers and you can go to lifechangingchallengers.com um and that podcast is about people that have overcome adversity in uncommon ways for instance my client instead of going the right way, the, the, the normal way of diet and exercise and going to the gym, she decided she was going to do that. So these are people that have gone over and above, done something different with their lives with their to overcome their adversities. Um, and it's just me having, it's just like, just like you and I are doing right now, having, a, having an interview. So there's stories of these people um, and how they've overcome these adversities and, and tragedies in their lives. Um, so I'd love for you to, 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 to have your listeners, maybe to take, take a listen to a couple of those episodes if they'd like. Um, but also there's a contact form on there to get a hold of me as well. And I'm on, and I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, X as Brad a minus. Well, we'll put all that in the show notes. So for those of you listening, you know, there's no excuse not to follow Brad, listen to his podcast, um, I love when I can tell my listeners that there is something else that they can listen to that will help them because you know what? You never know what is going to make your life better. we got to learn about it. And I certainly did today. And I'm going to take, you know, some of these notes back to my physical therapist and I'm going to ask some more questions because um, I don't plan on running a marathon. But you know what? I would like to walk two to three miles a day. So yeah. that is my goal. Thank you. What so about, much. and for you, what about the El Camino? Yes. In Spain, that's the route that Jesus took. It's yep. very big. And what about that? That'd be something. It's a walking. It's, there are some 
obstacles, but nothing huge. And you can take as long as you want. And it's beautiful. I love that too. There well, you go. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, Brad. It was good talking to you. Thank Bye -bye you. Now. Thank you for having me. Bye, Karen. Bye-bye.